السلام عليكم اعزائي الطلاب اتمنى لكم صحة والسلامة والموفقية ان شاء الله راح نحكي اليوم عن الجزء السادس للانفكشنز ديزيز which is the tapeworm or cystodes tapeworm are flat hemorrhoidetic worms that can live as parasites in the human gastrointestinal tract. Some of these organisms are primarily human pathogens, while others have animals as their natural hosts but can also cause human infection. We can divide it as causing intestinal infection or systemic infection. For example, there, is, there are Tinea saginata, Tinea sciatica, Daphylobotherium latum that can cause intestinal infection in humans following ingestion of intermediate hosts. Tinea saginata occurs world worldwide but is most common in areas where conception of undercooked beef is customary, such as Europe and parts of Asia. Most human carriers of adult tapeworms are asymptomatic. There may be associated symptoms, including nausea, anorexia, epigastric pain, peripheral eosinophilia may be observed. The diagnosis is usually established by identifying eggs or proglotids in the stool. We suggest Raziquantil for treatment of infection due to Tinea saginata, Daphylobotherium, etc. Dosing depends on the species. Nucleosamide is an acceptable alternative treatment if Raziquantil is not available. Following therapy, stools should be rechecked for eggs to document cure. Cysticercosis is caused by the larval stage of the pork tapeworm. Tinea solium. Clinical syndromes include neurocysticercosis and extraneural cysticercosis. Neural cysticercosis is divided into parenchymal and extraparenchymal forms. Stages of cysticercosis include initial viable phase, a degenerating enhancing phase, and non viable calcified phase. Cysticerci may be present in more than one anatomic site, and cysticerci at different stages in their natural history may be present simultaneously. Intraparenchymal cysticercosis is the most common form of cysticercosis. It occurs in more than 60% of cases. Onset of symptoms usually occurs 3 to 5 years following infection but can occur more than 30 years following infection. Seizures are the most common infection, are the most common, sorry, manifestation. Less common manifestation include altered vision, focal neurologic signs, and meningitis. In patients with massive numbers of parenchymal cysts, an intense immune response with diffuse edema, can cause clinical picture resembling encephalitis. Manifestations may include seizure, headache, nausea, and vomiting, impaired consciousness, reduced visual acuity, sometimes fever. Many cases of parenchymal cysticercosis are asymptomatic and are identified incidentally via radio radiographic imaging performed for other reasons. Intraventricular cysticercosis, which is a free floating cyst in the ventricular cavity or attached to the choroid plexus, occurs in 10 to 20% of cases.
typically symptoms develop when cystic cerci become lodged in the ventricular outflow tracts with consequent obstructive hydrocephalus and increased intracranial pressure. Associated symptoms include headache, nausea and vomiting, altered mental status, and decreased visual acuity with papilloedema. Subarachnoid neurocystic sarcosis is the most severe form occurs in about 5% of hospitalized cases and may be associated with a chronic arach arachnoiditis and or mass effect due to cyst enlargement. It may develop as a result of local inflammation. In some cases, it may be associated with communica communicating hydrocephalus, vasculitis, meningitis, and stroke. Prior to initiation therapy for cystic sarcosis, all patients should have an ophthalmologic examination to exclude ocular cystic sarcosis. In addition, patients who are likely to require prolonged corticosteroids should also undergo screening for latent TB infection, as well as screening or empiric therapy for citrongeloidosis. The initial approach to patients consists of managing acute symptoms if present such as an increased intracranial pressure and seizures. Thereafter, a determination should be made regarding the approach to management of antiparasitic and anti-inflammatory therapy. Clinical decisions should be tailored to individual patient circumstances. Echinococcus granulosa's infection is initially asymptomatic and may remain so for many years. Subsequent clinical features and complications depend upon the site and size of the cysts. The liver and lungs are, and are affected in approximately 67 and 25 percent of cases respectively. Most patients have single organ involvement and a single cyst is present in more than 70% of cases. The long-term long outcome is variable, and many patients remain asymptomatic. The diagnosis of echinococcus is typically established by ultrasound imaging in combination with serologic testing, usually ELISA test. High data disease is probable in the setting of ultrasound demonstrating infoldings of the inner cyst wall, separation of the high data membrane from the wall of the cyst or high data stand. Treatment of cystic echinococcus includes surgery, percutaneous management, drug therapy, and observation. We recommend albendazole for drug treatment. In the absence of albendazole, mebendazole may be used as an alternative therapy. Albendazole is dosed 10 to 15 mg per kg per day in two divided doses. The usual dose for adults is 400 mg twice daily taken with food. The optimal duration of definitive and adjunctive drug therapy is uncertain. 